our uh, band for our church. Amen. I used to play the drums, um, but uh, uh, I don't know if I'm going to teach my son or not. Amen. If you're interested in learning an instrument for the church or you want to play an instrument or something, get with me and my wife so we can figure something out. All right. For the future. OK, that's it. All the kids are dismissed. Take your time going downstairs. Amen. For the rest of us, let's open up our Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter six, verse 11, and just hold it right there. Matthew, chapter six. Verse 11, take your time, youngsters, amen. Have a good time downstairs to your class. So on Sundays, we've been doing the, the series on the Lord's Prayer. Uh, the first half of the prayer we talked about was just establishing who God is. Our Father was in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And now we're starting to get to the second half of the Lord's Prayer, where Jesus says, when you pray, Pray in this way. And he's not saying to just keep continually to uh, repeat those words. Some people do that, and I guess it can be effective in its own sense. But really what Jesus is saying is that this is the manner, this is the mindset, this is the thought process you should have as you're praying. And now we're getting to the first petition in the Lord's Prayer that has anything to do with us. All right? So today we're talking about give us this day our daily Bread. Uh, America has more than enough food for everyone to eat, but each year billions of pounds of perfectly good food go to waste. This is an article from uh, the uh, food, food Banks of America. Amen. What is food waste, they say? Food waste is safe, high-quality food that is thrown away rather than eaten. Food waste occurs for a variety of reasons, including uneaten food that is thrown away at homes, stores, and restaurants, Crops that are left in fields because of low crop prices or too many of the same crops being available. There could be problems during the manufacturing and the transportation of food that causes it to be thrown away. Or food cannot meet a retailer's standards for color and appearance. The article says how much food waste is there in the United States? And this reads each year 108 billion pounds of food is wasted in the United States. This equates to 130 billion meals and more than $408 billion in food thrown away each year. Shockingly, nearly 40% of all food in America is thrown away and wasted. Food goes to waste at every stage of production and distribution from farmers to packers and shippers, from manufacturers to retailers to our very homes. Food waste in our homes makes up about 39% of all food waste, about 42 billion pounds, while commercial food waste makes up 61% and the other 66 billion pounds. These statistics can be startling for us because we realize how blessed we are in America. Amen? How blessed we are to be living in a country where our waste, this is food waste, just food that is not eaten, perfectly good, perfectly fine, just thrown away, could literally like change the lives of millions and billions of people around the world. And the problem with America is that we are so blessed that sometimes without knowing it, we can have an, an entitled sense of, of responsibility towards things. And thinking about that, when we read the Lord's Prayer, a lot of people have oversight when we think about this line, give us this day our daily bread. Can you bring it up, son? Because we think about that and we say, give us this day our daily bread. Like, I don't have a problem with food. Amen. Maybe you don't as well. I don't. You could just look at me and see. I don't have a problem with eating. All right. Food is not an issue in my home. So sometimes we look at this part of the Lord's Prayer and, and we understand here that what Jesus is really talking about is more than just a piece of bread. Bread here is a symbol word that is used for all our physical needs. So bread can be symbolized as strength to even work or to wake up or to walk or, or to be able to type or, or do our jobs or, or be able to move around. Bread uh, gives us uh, stamina and energy, right, in order uh, to, to wake up, to get going, to do different things. 
how many know uh, bread and food uh, have the ability to keep our minds clear? Don't they say when you're real hungry, they call it being hangry? You know, you get a bad attitude, you want to go off on everybody, you know. Uh, uh, I hope I don't betray any confidence here, but my sisters, the Berrios women, my mom, they're this way. When they're hungry, you know it. You know, I know when my mom is hungry, I'm like, Mom, let me go get you something to eat. Amen. You know, like <laughs> the Snickers commercial where they say you're not yourself when you're hungry. Amen. So bread has this symbol that Jesus is trying to make us realize that it's deeper than just eating. And he's saying, Lord, the first thing that we should pray for when we get to ourselves, he says, is this daily bread, is this ability to say, God, give me the strength, give me the things I need to make it for this day, to be able to be sustained for this day, to be able to work to this day. You know, uh, uh, my, one of my brother-in-laws, uh, he doesn't believe that God is real, and, and, and we have our conversations at times, and and and. and he recently, he's been more open to, to me speaking to him about God. And, and we were talking about a, a God. And he goes, you know, God doesn't pay my bills. God doesn't put food in my house. I wake up every morning and I go to work and I get a paycheck. And I said, what you're missing is the Bible says our very breaths are given to us by God. So if God did not wake you up this morning, you would not make that money. You wouldn't make it to that job and you would therefore wouldn't have the things that you're saying you're getting on your own. And the sad thing is I can understand his mindset being somebody who doesn't believe in God. But a lot of Christians can think this way. We, we forget that our very lives, that our very bodies, that the very fact that you're up this morning has been a gift from God has been God giving you your daily bread, your daily sustenance. The Bible says that tomorrow is not promised to anybody, to nobody in this world. doesn't care. You know, how, this is not a sermon to say you can just overeat, amen. And I, but, but it doesn't matter if you're unhealthy or the healthiest person. God says, your very life is in my hands. When the day your soul is required of you is the day that you will go on to be with the Lord. And we can't overlook this. This is very important. Because in the, in the process of this life, what the enemy wants to do to us in our prayers is he only wants us coming to God for the things that we feel we can't do ourselves. But in reality, God says, I want to hear from you about everything. Because there is nothing that you can do for yourself. See, the enemy wants you to start off small and say, well, if I went to work or, or my spouse went to work and that's why I got food in my house, then that will start off small and continue on from there. It's a mindset and it gets gradual. So then you go, oh, well, well, well if I was, don't go to the doctor, then I'll be sick or all these different things. And we'll start to lose our faith in God and his ability to provide for us our daily needs. And we'll start to sustain ourselves in this life and we'll start to focus on ourselves and then we will begin to just becoming a God like, like he's a lottery ticket. Or like God is a vending machine. That's how a lot of Christians treat prayer. I'm going to come and, and I'm going to put my little coin of prayer in and I'm going to select what I want from God. And imagine this is a vending machine. Bloop. Okay, God, give me health. Right? Put a little coin in. All right, God, this is what I want today. This is what I need right now. And this is the mindset of a lot of believers. And Jesus says, your very life, the very day-to-day -day essence of your being is provided to you by our Heavenly Father. And we need to acknowledge that in our prayers. We all have daily needs. And God created us this way. Imagine God created all the animals in the earth. You, know, you ever notice that animals, they run on instinct. That's what separates us from animals, all right? Animals have an instinct. They do things. They don't know why they do it. They don't question why they do it. They just do it. The birds fly south in the winter because God created them to do that. The monarch butterflies migrate because God created them to do that. A, a butterfly will not just wake up one day and say, I'm not migrating. They just do what God has put into order in their lives. Human beings, we were made in the image of God. So God gives us a free will, but he created something in us. Notice the way that he made our skin and he made our eyes and he made our bodies. We need God for substance. We need God for clothing. We need God for food. You know, imagine if God would have made us where we didn't need fuel for our body. That's what food is. That's what calories are. 
Calories is fuel for your body. If you're overweight, then you ate too much fuel. You're not burning enough energy. It's like a, a car where you're putting gas in and it just starts, at some point it starts overfilling. Too much gas in the tank. Amen. But God made us that way. We're not machines where, where you just lube up a little bit of oil and we start moving and we're robots. God created us to have a purpose, to need a purpose. One of the sad things about life is so many human beings go their whole life without ever realizing their purpose for being on this earth. Just, just moving through this fear. No direction. You know, no no insight to anything further. Like, is this all life has to offer? When, when I first uh, got saved, that was the biggest question I used to ask myself. Is this all that life is ever going to be? Wake up, go to work. You know, my, one of my wife's co-workers, uh, she, she has a, a guy at home who doesn't work, right? But he's able to work, he just doesn't. He drinks a lot. So my wife was telling her, her co-worker, hey, even when my husband was a drug addict, he still went to work in the morning. And that was my mindset. I could be hungover. I could be partying from the night before. There was many times where I, I'm a truck driver by trade where I would actually have not slept the night before, still be high, and I would go to work and do my loads. I never miss work. And I started to wake up at 24 years old. I said, is this all that there is to life? Wake up, go to work, come home get drunk, get high, wake up, go to work, come home, get drunk, get high, fight with my wife, get in an argument, I leave the house, she moves out, she moves back in, I move out, I move back in. Is this it? Is this all there's ever going to be? And that's because I didn't know what my purpose was in this world. God made us to need purpose. If you're left to your own devices... You will not seek out purpose in your life. You will come to just this crazy routine and life will get so mundane and then depression starts to set in, anxiety starts to set in, loneliness starts to set in, isolation starts to set in because you are not living your purpose that God has created you to. Even in paradise, God created human beings to have purpose. Look at Genesis chapter 1 verse 28. He didn't just put Adam and Eve in the garden and then tell them, Lay around all day and be chilling. Look what he tells them. God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful. Fruitful gives us the, the terminology, go do something that has progression, that something comes out of it. He says, be fruitful and multiply. We know what he's talking about there, right? And fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Even the first two human beings who ever existed, God gave them purpose. God says, I created you to need me. We are not self-sufficient as much as we want to think. We can't do it all ourselves. You know, they, they have that little TikTok trend where they ask somebody to spell out independent, and then they start singing that song. It was a worthy song from back in the day, right? I-N-D-E-P-E-N. No, we're not independent like we think. We might visualize that, but as we read God's word, we understand. No, I need God just to breathe. You ever thought about breathing? How, how that's an act of God. You ever notice that you don't even think about breathing, it just happens. That is an act of God. God's the one who created us that way. If we had to control our breathing, we'd be suffocating. Man, I forget where my wallet is every day. I'll forget how to breathe if it wasn't for God. Maybe you're not like me. Maybe you got a, the, like Brother Joe, you got the mind of a steel trap. Like you can remember things. I'm the opposite. I forget all kinds of stuff. And God says, the very essence of your life, you need from me. You have needs because God created you that way. And God says, you can't go through this life, especially as a believer, and tell yourself that you don't need God even for your daily needs. If you're only coming to God for the big things, you're in trouble. You're in trouble in your life. You'll miss out on your God-designed purpose. 
You'll miss out on being fruitful and multiplying and doing what it is that God has called you to do. I have never been in a better state of contentment in my life than simply just doing what God has called me to do, which is pastoring this church. My life is not perfect. I'm missing a lot of things. But the peace that I get from knowing I'm in God's will, this is what God created me for. The joy that I get from even teaching a simple Bible study, when at first it was just me and my wife and, you know, Joe Shar and Jim before Sister Irene started coming and the rest of you guys started to come. And I remember it gave me joy. It gave me purpose. I don't roam through this life with no direction. I know what God has for me. And the reason God created this way is because God wants the glory in supplying our needs. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. See, a lot of Christians use this to pray for their food, right? We pray for our food. Bless this food, right? In Jesus' name. God is good. God is great. Thank you for this big plate. Amen? <laughs> right? We pray for our food, but this is why they do that. You know, it's funny, but this is the scripture they're using. But what's crazy to me is the mindset of human beings, how we read this scripture and then we just stop at eating. Go ahead, son, put it back up. He said, whether you eat or you drink, whatever you do, do to the glory of God. See, God says, your whole life, I want the glory. God wants us to glorify him in our lives more than just praying for, for an omelet, you know, or chorizo and eggs or whatever it is you're eating that day. God says, no, in your prayer life, we need to be glorifying God for our needs. We should eat and, and thank God and say, God, you woke me up this morning. God, you started me off on this day. You know, there's a lot of people who didn't wake up. I got friends of mine that had never seen another day of life. I was preaching at a, at a youth event, you know, and, and uh, there was a group of kids who were in the back of the church. You could just tell they were just, uh, just mocking everything. And the sad thing is that these young kids come from a church where there was a young man that was going to that church, man, really loved God. Want, wanted to be a pastor, wanted to preach God's word, and, and the young man loses his life in a car accident. And these kids are from that church, from that youth group. And I remember something in me as I was preaching, and I see him, and usually I, I don't care what people are doing when they're preaching. You know, kids act crazy. Adults act crazy. You should see the adults I see while I'm preaching. <laughs> Things like that don't necessarily bother me. I, I could just push on through it. But for some reason that night, I'm sitting there, and I'm preaching the word of God, and, and I can just see them, and I can hear them. It was weird. It was like their voices were elevated. That's all I heard in the sermon. And you know, out of nowhere, I said, you know what is so sad and I'll never understand about God? And then the room got quiet. So one thing I would never understand is why God takes young men that want to serve him, takes them home, and then leaves us with goofy dudes like you who can't even take this serious. I said, I'll never understand it. And I'll have to take that to God someday when I see him. But that's one thing that always perplexes me and confuses me. Man, God, why do you take the people that want to serve you and then you give life and you give air and you give breath to people who could care less. Whatever we do, do to the glory of God. This is why I preach with such fervor. This is why me and my wife are here in this city. Because we said, man, why would I get saved? Why would I come to God and then, and then give God some mediocre life? And then not take it serious. He's the one who created me. He's the one who made me what I am. Ten years ago, man, seven years ago is when I got saved. Eight years ago, you guys, nobody in this church would have even gave me the time of day. And that's not a knock on you. That's a knock on me. I was ignorant. I was a low life. I was nobody. Nobody to listen to. Nobody to sit and even hear how my day's going. And where I'm at today is God did this to me. God changed me. 
God took me places I, I never would have thought I ever would have gone. I've been blessed to preach all over this country, and it always blows my mind when I'm at these other churches and people are like talking to me, and they're like, man, pray for me. And I'm like, man, I was a nobody. I could have died and just been a blimp in this world. Nobody besides my parents and my family would have even cared that my life was taken from me. But God did more for me. So we glorify him. God says, glorify me in everything we do. Everything you have is because of me. Everything. Life itself. And when we're praying, give us this daily bread, this is the attention we're giving unto God, not ourselves. Prayer is not about me and you and our wish list. Amen? It's not about, okay, if I say this in the right way or I pray 10 times until next Sunday, then God's got to do this. Right. That's not what prayer is. And Jesus was trying to get his disciples to understand this because the reason the disciples are asking is because they noticed when Jesus prayed, things happened. There's an old evangelist from the 1800s. That he, he had an awesome prayer ministry. They said the church used to have more people in prayer than in the service. So one pastor asked him, I think it was D.L. Moody, asks this man, he says, how do you get all these people in prayer? He goes, because when God moves and people believe it works, people come to pray. But people don't pray this way because they're only coming to God for their needs or, or their idea of what they think God should do. Has nothing to do with God's glory. Has nothing to do with God's will. So their prayers go unanswered. And as soon as their prayers go unanswered, they say, God must not be real. Prayer doesn't work. And the prayer rooms will be empty. Give us this day our daily bread, God. Lord, have your way, your will. Lord, you give me, wake me up. Allow me to walk. Allow me to breathe, Lord. There's even some people, some Christians, who pray like spoiled children. Instead of saying, give us this day our daily bread, they scream and they cry, give me my bread now. Demands, declares, decrees. Name it and claim it. That's what that... that uh, Teaching reflects. They're saying you are speaking it into existence. You're not speaking anything into existence. They use scriptures like death and life are in the power of the tongue. That's not talking about speaking a, a Cadillac into my driveway. That's talking about either speaking life into somebody and controlling your tongue or speaking down to somebody and speaking discouragement and destroying their confidence, destroying their connection to God because you're rude and unruly with your tongue. But it's what humans always want to do. Humans want to be God. They want to be in control. They want to create things. They want to be in charge. It's been that way from the beginning of time. That was the problem with the devil. That's why we're in this mess now. He wasn't satisfied bringing glory to God. He wanted the glory to go to him. And he was cast down. Give us this day our daily bread is a statement of faith because it's more broader than just praying for an Italian sub. We're saying, God, give me the ability to live this life even just day to day. All the scriptures when you read about the future all have to do with it being uh, subjected to God deciding that we even have a future. Jesus told him, don't, don't walk around saying, in this day we'll do this, in this day we'll do that. He says, man, your very next day has to be that God will give it to you. Has to be God's will that you even have. He says, do not be worried about tomorrow. God knows you need all these things. Worry about today. That's why the Bible says today is the day of salvation. So I tell people when they're trying to get saved, just worry about today. Don't worry about tomorrow. Just try to live for God today. It's enough problems right there. Well, you know what we do? Oh, man, how could I come to church every Sunday for the rest of my life for all eternity? Why are you even thinking that far ahead? Saying, today I'm coming to church. Today I'm going to give God his glory. James 4.3 says, you ask and you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives so that you may splend it on your pleasures. This is what people have made prayer, my pleasures. 
They shouldn't call it prayer anymore. They should call it pleasures. I'm taking my pleasures unto the Lord. And Jesus told them, prayer and talking to God is not about any of that. Think about one of the most famous prayers that was ever prayed when Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. What did that prayer have to do with pleasure? What was Jesus saying? Man, if there's any way that this can pass from me. Speaking about the cross and the death he was going to have to endure. And then he ends and says, but nevertheless, God, your will be done. Oh, we have more Christians who will pray that way. God, your will be done. What do you want from me, God? What do you want me to do? How do you want me to act? How do you want me to behave? What are the things you want me to say? But few people pray that way. We come to God and we say, oh, well, this is what I want. This is what I, what I need. In reality, we don't even need those things. And we come and, we'll, and God says, pray for your daily bread. And we're asking for our cake and chocolate icing, right? Like the saying goes, you can't have your cake and eat it too, right? I wonder where they, I always wonder where that came out. I haven't researched it yet. Maybe you could do that for me and bless me with that information. And they say, God, I'm praying. You say you're going to provide my daily bread for me. And God says, yeah, but you're not asking for just contentment in your life. You're asking for above and beyond. I was at a church one day, and a young man was telling me, he's like, you're into poverty. You're into people being poor. I'm, like, I'm not into people. I'm not poor. What are you talking about? I'm not poor. And he's like, oh, because um, during the, the men's class, you were saying that, that you would leave your job and you would give all those things up for God's kingdom. Yeah, I would. I was speaking about myself. I wasn't telling other people to do that. I go, because for me, it's priority. I don't even think about poverty. I know God's going to take care of me. Amen. He's done it before. When we started this church, I went from making $1,800 a week to within one month of opening these doors, my job being removed from me, fired. Couldn't get a job anywhere. Imagine that, $1,800 a week to working at Kohl's. One night a week, they were giving me seven and a half hours at 7.35 an hour. From one night to the next. The whole way, we never skipped the bill. The whole time my life was like that, never went without a meal. God did that. And God showed me something in that time. That's why I'm preaching this way today, because I used to think that way. That's the way I've been my whole life. If something has to get done, I'm going to do it. And God had to remove that from me and say, hey, you better pay attention. I'm the very reason you're alive. And I had to learn to trust him. And things were happening. People who didn't even know about our situation would come. They were dropping off groceries. We were getting gift cards in the mail to all these to different. The whole step of the way, God moved. I got family members who are cheap. I mean, cheap. And the very ones would call me out of nowhere. Hey, Junior, I don't know why, but I, the Lord, something put this on my heart. I, I just deposited $200 in your bank account. Because God took care of me and my family. He gave us our daily bread. And I know this and I believe this. It's one day at a time. The petition here says, give us this day. A very simple, yet hard to understand truth is that everything in this life is day by day. Elmer Towns puts it like this. When you pray for bread for this day, you are expressing ultimate confidence in God. You are recognizing that he is your father and you are his child. Think of little children playing in the yard. It is a beautiful spring day to enjoy their tricycles. They ride without thinking about who gave them the tricycles. They play in the grass without thinking about who's going to mow it. They eat a sandwich without thinking about who will plant crops in the spring so that it will grow in the summer with a full harvest. Putting bread on the table is the father's job. 
Children have few worries because they trust their parents. When you pray for bread for this day, you are exercising ultimate confidence in your heavenly father to provide for your needs. I was telling my son and my daughter the other day, I said, man, don't be in a rush to grow up. Believe me, you got the rest of your life to be dealing with drama. Enjoy being a kid. When I was 12, 13, I was in a rush to grow up. Wanted to learn to drive, wanted to go to work. I remember I was working full time at 15 years old. In a rush to grow up. I tell my kids, enjoy your youth. The Bible says, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Why was Jesus saying that? That's, that's how people are in heaven. Full and ultimate trust in God. I remember being a kid. I never worried about how the pantry was going to be full or what was in the refrigerator. I didn't think about those things. My only concern was what I was going to do for the day. Am I going to go play basketball? Am I going to play dodgeball? Am I going to play kickball? Whatever. I never thought about that stuff. See, as parents, that's our concern. We go to work and we do the bills and we're budgeting and we're like, man, I got to make sure we got this for our kids and that for our kids. This is the same way that, that Jesus is trying to relate us to heaven. Remember he started, he said, our father who is in heaven. He's saying, think this way about God. God is our father. He's got it under control. You don't worry about it. You go enjoy your life. Matthew 6, 7, 8 says, and when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetitions as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. What you need. I want to end this message by talking about being content. Contentment. How much bread makes up daily bread? Does God supply all we need or all we want? Do we pray for necessity or do we pray for luxuries? Do we pray for daily bread or are we praying for strawberry shortcake? Proverbs 38. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 8. That sounded like I said Proverbs 38. Keep deception and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion. This is a scripture that's telling us how to live with contentment. It's saying, God, don't give me poverty. Don't make me poor. And don't even make me rich. People are like, hold on, Pastor. I would love to be rich. But see, this is the mindset. And I'm going to explain why he says this in a minute. He says, feed me with the food that is my portion. Teach me, God, to be content with what is my portion in life. You know, when we went to visit Sister Emma, she, she told me something that has stuck with me last year. She probably doesn't even remember. But we went and we said, my wife would tell her, man, Emma, you got such a lo lovely home. And she goes, it's not much, but it's mine. I was thinking about that. Me and my wife, we think about that every day. This is my portion. Look what God has blessed me with. Look at what I have. Might not be much, but it's mine. It might not be everything, but it's mine. I might not have my bathroom with the marble floors and the heated tiles and the, you know, a heated toilet seat and the, whatever they got nowadays. Now they got the bidets that wash your rear end, ain't it? Like, man, how lazy you got to be to wipe yourself? <laughs> but what is our portion? Ever thought about that, God? What is my portion? Am I content with what you've given me? Or, or I'm only focused on what I don't have. Me and my wife, we share the same background in a sense where she grew up broke and I grew up broke, but just in different countries. She grew up in Mexico and I grew up here in the States. We're talking about how we didn't even know that we didn't have money. I didn't know. I didn't think about that stuff. Whatever, I remember when we first, we used to live in a, a two bedroom apartment in East Chicago, my dad had five kids. I was the, the last one of, of, of five kids, four sisters ahead of me. One little bathroom. I remember my sister Angie and Christina, they got the other bedroom. My mom and dad got one room. My sister Angie and Christina, the two oldest, they got the other bedroom. My sister Vanessa, Melissa, and then me, we were the three youngest. We, we used to sleep in the living room. And I remember that the, the floor was hard tile. It wasn't a carpet or anything. So we only had one sofa, and it wasn't, it wasn't even a love seat. It wasn't even a huge sofa. 
So we used to take turns. Every night, somebody got to sleep on the sofa, and the other two slept on the floor. And I was thinking back to that, because the other day I'm laying in my bed, and, and I'm like, oh, man, this bed, I need a new bed. This bed's killing me. This is on my back, and this and that. And then the Lord brought that flashback to me. He's like, remember when you used to sleep on the floor? Some of the happiest times of my life as a kid. Hanging out with my sisters, hanging, just being content with what I had. And I said, God, forgive me. Because he's blessed me so much that now I'm looking at my portion, and instead of being thankful for it, I'm worried about somebody else's portion. There's a Christian rapper who said, you're looking at my plate, that's why your food got cold. There's a lot of truth in that statement. Sometimes we're looking at other people's plates. And that's why our stuff is getting cold. And that's why we can't, this is the curse of social media. See, the reason why I didn't know I was broke is because I didn't know what rich was. But today, we know what rich is because it's at our fingertips. All we see is what everybody has that we don't have. Oh, they just bought a brand new car. Oh, they just bought a bigger house. Oh, they just bought this. Oh, I don't have this, and I don't have that. And my kids don't got the new Jordans, and my son don't got a PS5. And, oh, man, then we get on our husbands, right? Oh, you got, you got to go work more hours. And the husband's like, you got to go to work. And it's just a big old ordeal because we're looking at everybody else's plate. And here the Bible says, feed me with my food that is my portion. The next verse, Proverbs chapter 30, verse 9, he gives us the reason why. He says, so that I, n- I not be fool and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or that I not be in want and steal and profane the name of God. So he said, there's two curses to each one. If you're rich, he says, you're going to fall into the trap of saying, who's God? Look at me and all the things that I've done for myself. And then he said, if you're dirt poor, then you're going to do things that are not right. And you're going to say, it's because God hasn't given me anything. So he's saying, I don't want to be rich and I don't want to be poor. Just give me what's my portion, God. Help me to live in that. Matthew 6, 25 says, for this reason, I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat and what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air that they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? This is Jesus telling us. Look at the birds in the sky. He says they don't work for anything or anything, and they're living. All the animals in the world, God sustains them. Even all the way down to the bugs, even all the way down to the cockroaches. You know, they say a cockroach is the only thing that's going to survive a nuclear holocaust. God even took care of the roaches. He makes sure they got something to eat. God says, aren't you not worth much more than them? Don't you think that God says, my daughter, my son, is more important to me than some bird in the air? Or some roach behind a crawl space? God says, I'll take care of you. And if we look back on it, a lot of Christians, we're taking care of, we're okay. And we're not going to have everything, but we're okay. He says, I'll take care of your daily needs. Philip Parman tells a story of a rich industrialist who was disturbed to find a fisherman sitting lazily beside his boat. Why aren't you out there fishing, he asked. Because I've caught enough fish for the day, says the fisherman. Well, why don't you catch more fish than you need, the rich man asked. So the fisherman replied and said, well, what would I do with him? He said, what do you mean? You could earn more money. You could buy a better boat so that you could go out deeper and catch more fish and make more money. You could purchase better nets that catch even more fish and make more money. You can buy more boats with better nets and more fishermen that go out and catch more fish and make more money. You could actually be rich like me. And the fisherman turns and says, well, once I'm rich, then what would I do? To which the rich man told him, you could sit down then and enjoy your life. The fisherman turned around and told him, what do you think that I'm doing now? I'm sitting back and enjoying my life. This is the parable of the rich man. The Bible says that the rich man was a blessed person. And because he was so blessed, he says, I got to build all these barns now. 
to contain my blessing. So he builds barns. They get full, builds more. Spends his whole life building barns. And one day the Bible says this man wakes up and says, now I'm okay. Now I have enough. Now I'm just going to sit back and enjoy my life. To which God responded and told him, you fool, today your soul is required of you. Now who will spend the things you worked your entire life for? What are we doing with the overflow? God says, you're blessed. Your barn is full. Like this fisherman, you have enough for today, but you know what to do? No, no, it can't be enough for today. I need to go out and get more and more and more and more and more. You know, the trick about that is we never know when's enough. We'll spend our whole lives. And then Jesus says, at the end of it, Who's going to spend those things that you work so hard for? Isn't that crazy? One day we're going to pass away. I don't know when. And somebody who didn't work one day for the money that's in my bank account is going to get to spend it. Somebody who didn't go and punch in at one o'clock. My son thinks it's him, but I don't know yet. Somebody who didn't put in no hours, somebody who didn't paint the bedroom, somebody who didn't lay the new floor down, somebody who didn't do any of those things is going to get it all. So then what was it all for? This is Jesus saying, you're spending your whole life spending to do things to what? To leave it to somebody else? Why not build your life for things that are, are going to spend in eternity? That's why he says... Store your treasures up in heaven. He's not talking about living a poor life. He's saying just be content with what you got. And learn to enjoy your life where you're at. Because it could be a lot worse. Think about that. We could be in Nairobi, Africa right now. With a, wait, two cups of rice to share between all of us. <laughs> but we're here, how? By the grace of God. You think I was up in heaven as a baby telling Jesus... You better make me an American citizen and I better be born in America. No, I'm only here blessed because this is where God placed me. There's people all over this world going without. All over this world, but we're here learning to be content. There's a famous scripture and I'll leave you with this. We all know it, right? Philippians 4.13, a lot of people even get it tattooed on them. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, Right? And we use this verse for a lot of different things. You know, athletes use it. I can win the Super Bowl because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I could be a great businessman or a great businesswoman because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But if you read this verse in context, you will understand that all Paul is talking about is being content. He says, I can be content because Christ is the one who strengthens me. Let's go to verse 11. He says, not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. Verse 12, I know how to get along with humble means, meaning I know how to go without. And I also know how to live in prosperity. I know how to live when I got a bunch of stuff. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry both of having abundance and suffering need. And then we get to verse 13 where he says, I can do all things 